lot of these ancient cultures all talk about, um, you know, the fact that sound creates levitation. Yeah. And in Tibet, the monks have this capability of not only raising up these giant boulders with chants and frequencies coming out of their own mouths, yeah. but also pinpointing exactly where they want the boulder to drop or fall or be located. So that's powerful stuff. I'm looking forward to Tibet. That's one of the things I'm planning for for 2023 or 2024. I'm trying to get accepted by the monastery so I can stay there for three months. That's my ultimate goal. It's not going to be easy, but if I have to stay there and bang on the door or bang them, or whatever I got to do, I don't care. But I'm going to be with those monks. At some point in the future, I'm going to stay with the monks for a few months in Tibet. That's my, that's my ultimate goal, really. Uh, but yeah, it's really amazing. They have so many amazing secrets. If you look into the biblical story, the walls of Jericho, what happened there? They encircled the, uh, the city and they began to chant in a way that created a cymatic frequency that caused the walls to collapse. It's all about frequency and vibration. They, they weaponized the sound, is what they did. That's a true story, you know? So it's all about understanding how sound works and how frequencies work. Thoth actually was able to combine cymatic frequencies and light waves to create solid matter. So you can create solid physical matter, which we learned yesterday, we talked about in the morning, yesterday morning, we talked about creating solid matter from light. And scientists have now finally achieved it. So we have now, we're just rediscovering everything. We can create solid matter from light. We can alter matter and bend matter from cymatic frequencies and vibrations. We understand now that this pattern you see, oh, you saw it, there you go, the, uh, underneath the image there, that pattern is part of a uh, frequency or vibration, ultimately that really stems from strings, vibrating strings in the universe. And those vibrating strings, they brush across or run across us every, you know, plonk second of every, every plonk moment of every day. So that alters your DNA. So if you, if you're, uh, you have the genetics of a cheetah, when that frequency hits you, that's coming through the universe with these vibrating strings, it puts the pattern on your back. If you're a turtle, it puts the, the pattern on the back of your, your shell. You know, all of these things, it gives us shape, it gives us form, it gives us all the different appearances, it gives us our different features. It's based on how your genetics and your DNA responds to these vibrating uh, sources, these cymatic vibrations. That's really how, you, how your body is, uh, is set up and how all the patterns of life is, are all set up based off of these vibrations. The zebra gets its stripes from the vibrations that are emanating from strings. Okay, so that's how it works. Everything is based off of, uh, off of vibration and frequency, everything. Um, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. We brushed on this a little bit the last time, but I wanted to bring this up to some of the new people. A lot of people, um, you know, haven't seen some of the uh, science. This is actually in my book, Behind, um, you know, the, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's really an amazing structure, obviously, mathematically, what it has and what it can do. But the amazing thing is the correlation. Oh, here, look, I opened it right up. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I open the book, that's great. Uh, it's right there. The whole thing is in there, guys. Uh, it's really amazing with the Great Pyramid, the science that's built into it about this planet. We kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Now, the pyramid is a 43,200 scale of the Earth, 432. You're gonna see that number consistently within the pyramid, 432, 432. It resonates at 400 hertz, okay? And you, as you know, all of my music is encoded at 432 because it's a healing frequency. It's a, it's a realignment frequency. It's a vibrational frequency that's good for humans to listen to. 440 hertz is what most music comes out on the radio, and it literally is set to destroy your brain. Literally, like literally, it used to be 432, and then the media mogul, people in control of the media, which was actually the, uh, it wasn't the Rockefeller Foundation, it was the Rockefeller Foundation. They actually requested it be changed to 440. Yeah, so they knew the effects of frequency on people back then, and that was not too long ago, they changed it to 440. Um, Earth's mass, the mass of the pyramid equals the volume times density. I mean, this is just amazing stuff. Since the mean density of the Earth is defined as 1.0, then the mass of the Earth is 10 to the 15th power. 
time to mass in the pyramid tons is 5.272, which basically what's been calculating is Earth's mass. We all be calculated from within this great pyramid. The speed of the Earth around the sun, the pyramid inch times 10 to the eighth power equals the speed of the Earth around the sun, circa 26,000, I'm sorry, 2600 BCE. So at the time that these calculations were done, that's about the, that was, that's what the speed of the Earth was around the sun. The mass of the Earth, the weight of the pyramid is approximately 5,985 tons, multiplied by 10 to the eighth power, gives a reasonable estimate of the Earth's mass. See, this, this the Great Pyramid is a gigantic stone computer, and it's also a, a complete replica of the Earth itself. The Great Pyramid is the Earth. It's, a, it's the Earth scale down. All the dimensions of the planet Earth can be found, and all the information about it can be found here. Not only that, other things as well. The light equation, the height of the Great Pyramid minus the height of the capstone represents one billionth of the time it takes light to travel the mean radius of Earth's orbit around the sun, one astronomical unit. Using one pyramid inch equals 24 hours, which is a mean solar day. I mean, I can just keep going on. The velocity of light, so the speed of light, with the distance of one AU, which is an astronomical unit. So an astronomical unit, for those who don't know, is the distance from the Earth to the sun. So that's our basis of calculation for how far away anything is in the universe, especially in our solar system. So if we want to say, okay, how far away is Pluto, for example? We have to measure how many times the distance from Earth to the Sun can be calculated or added up to equal the distance of Pluto, and that's how you get the astronomical unit, the astronomical unit or the AU. The velocity of light basically is the distance of one AU, known as the transit time of light. For this same distance, velocity of light can be found. Uh, you can also find the, find the velocity of light located in the latitude of the Grand Gallery inside the Great Pyramid. So if you find the latitude of the Grand Gallery leading up to the King's Chamber, it's going to be the exact same digits of the speed of light in meters per second. And that means that meters existed before we rediscovered them. And when you look in the Sumerian history, the Proto-Sumerian, you discover that they discovered the uh, meters per second, like they discovered a metric system in Proto-Sumerian in South America, in Mexico, which is in museums today. So it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, the Great Pyramid, of course, was a power generator. It was built on top of an aquifer. So as moving water would go underneath the pyramid, where there are now just empty tubes, it would create physiostatic electricity. And that physiostatic electricity would move up into the queen's chamber and then get generated and powered up the, uh, you know, we talked about yesterday, up through the Grand Gallery, resonating arms, and then it would again get powered up through the king's chamber and then sent up through the apex. So just a lot of amazing things about, um, the Great Pyramid, and I cover a lot of it in the book. Pretty interesting stuff, and it proves that uh, these people were extremely advanced. In order to have these types of calculations built into a structure like this, you have to take a computer or some type of device, or maybe it's in the guy's head if he's that brilliant, and you have to say, I want this list of information in this structure. <laughs> so you take this advanced CAD design system, right? And you say, I want all these things to be known about built into the, the construction of this building. And then you take it and you download it into this program that then begins to extrapolate everything that needs to be done in terms of the, all the size, and shapes, and dimensions, and everything else. And then it says, okay, this is what we got. This is the size it's got to be. This is what the base has to be. This is what the height has to be. Uh, it's really amazing. If you look at the Perry Reese map, does anybody here know about the Perry Reese map? A couple of people. The Perry Reese map is an ancient map of the planet Earth. And what's really amazing about it, the Perry Reese map shows Antarctica what it looks like without ice. What it looks like without ice. And when we did the uh, deep penetrating radar scans, we discovered that that's exactly what Antarctica looks like without ice. The other amazing thing is, the Perry Reese map is, dri is drawn from a particular perspective. In order to draw the map the way it's laid out, you have to be directly above Cairo in space. Yeah, that's the only way to get the way it, the way it's laid out on that parchment. You have to be directly above Cairo in space. Yes, it has. Yeah, the whole the whole world on it. But the angles that it's laid out and the way that it's kind of warped, it's the Cairo perspective. So you know everything has a perspective. If you're if you're, on, if you're above Africa, everything else is going to be skewed. So they can calculate the exact location 
or the perspective that the person used when they threw out the map. These structures, like the Great Pyramid, which what he was saying was, you know, the Great Pyramid is the average height of the land mass around the entire planet Earth. You to calculate that we talked about yesterday, you have to put a satellite in North Pole orbit. And so the, the satellite has to orbit the planet this way, while the planet spins on its axis. And then they take all those images and they stitch them together, and then you get, uh, because of the technology used while it's taking the imagery, you actually, you know, get to scan the planet, and you get the topography of the planet, the heights and the lows of all the land mass. And then you can calculate what the average height of land mass is based off the peaks. And once you have the peaks and the average height of land mass, they said, okay, this is the height the Great Pyramid is going to be. So they built it to the exact height of the average land mass, but they had to have a satellite to do that. That's part of the doc documentary we're working on. Could, we're, we're proposing questions. Could the Black Knight satellite have been used to make these, you know, these calculations uh, based on some of the orbiting that we've seen as in retrograde orbit? <clears throat> It's about five degrees above the equator, which we couldn't do that until like the, the middle of the 2000s to put something into a five degree above the equator orbit, uh, which is pretty interesting. So there's a lot of really cool things about it, and it's changed course a couple of times. What we're talking about is the Black Knight satellite. It's an object that's in space. Uh, it's considered space junk on all space agencies websites, but it's a massive object. I'm going to give y'all a sneak peek. That's about 15 estimated tons. Pictures were taken in HD by the um, by the uh, STS mission, uh, space shuttle mission, and the images are available to the general public. This is from one of my greatest novel hunters, Martin Brainy. Yeah, he initially thought it was maybe coming from Mars. Uh, he realized, I think, a little later, it seems like it was closer to the planet, and um, it made the front page of several major newspapers. It was identified by the U.S. military. They got scared when they first saw it because they thought it was a spy satellite from Russia. And then they said, wait a damn minute, 15,000 tons estimate, you know, the size of the thing is massive. And they realized, wait a minute. So Russia said, nah, man, we thought you guys put that up there. And that's when um, um, one of the former military officers came forward. His name was... Uh, I can't remember his name at this exact moment, but he, he said that uh, we knew that was up there for a very long time, but but uh, the general population is just not finding out about it, and it comes very close in its orbit around the planet, around the North uh, North America, where you can see with the naked eye every two years. But yeah, so it's really an amazing object. It's uh, At the time that it made Time Magazine, there were thought to be not only that one, but another one up there. Um, and it was also sending a signal, or it still transmits a signal, and some ham radio operators were able to get the signal, and they decoded the signal. And so the signal gives the location to the Boetis star system, but the Boetis star system where it was located 13,000 years ago in the sky. So the estimates of this thing could be 13,000 years. We're not saying that it is, but it could be 13,000 years old. But that's the Black Knight satellite right there. And it's uh, pretty big. This is video you're going to see of the space shuttle flying over it. It's going to absolutely blow you away. Original footage shot from the ISS. Right. Label as space junk on NASA.gov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they think we're idiots. They, they do think they we're do. idiots. They laugh at us. Yeah. They laugh at us. There's a former yeah. NASA scientist in my documentary, <laughs> and uh, a lot of anomaly hunters, and uh, Richard Dolan, you know. Former Ministry of Defense in England and all. I got some really good, good people that are being interviewed for this documentary. It's going to be on Amazon, Amazon Fire Stick, Amazon Prime. It hopefully will be edited and completed by the summer so that it can be live before the fall. But uh, yeah, this is the Black Knight satellite. It's up there above our heads right now, watching us. Who watches the watchers? The interesting thing that I'm bringing to the table with this is how it was, um, you know. A lot of people have talked about it over the, over time, but never have brought the story the way I'm bringing it, combining it with the Sumerian tablets and cylinder scrolls that depict this and depict two people talking to each other through this device, uh, using it as a communication device. So it's pretty interesting, and uh, even the shape of it is pretty interesting. It kind of almost looks like a bird of prey in a way, you know, like a Vulcan bird of prey in Star Trek. Um, and it's also changed course a couple of times. Mm. There's a supposed um, um, report that it actually followed Sputnik around the moon. I don't know if you know what Sputnik is. Mm -hmm. That's the very first satellite ever to, 
to actually successfully go to lunar orbit and come back. And that's Sputnik by the Russians. The Russians beat us there. And this object supposedly followed Sputnik to the moon. So it's going to be an amazing documentary. A lot of great interviews with very credible sources and credible people that were involved and everything else. So I'm really excited about it. It's going to be amazing. This thing is up there, guys. Watch this. This is, you know, part of the story. Ancient history. Who was this thing transmitting information to? Is it just here to, these are the questions we're proposing. Is it here to, to watch us, to make sure we don't blow ourselves up with a nuclear war? Is it here to find out when human beings achieve a level of consciousness so that it signals to come, it's time for you guys to come back and interact with us in any kind of way, shape, or form? Is it a scout to uh, scan our planet for resources? Uh, you know, that may be usable for another civilization, and maybe at one point in the future they're coming to get them. One thing that folks says in the Ample Tablets, he says, uh, far from the deep, an enemy will come, and those who will, uh, the smart person will rise my spaceship from underneath the Sphinx and defeat them with ease. You know, interesting. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and then they did a deep uh, penetrating radar muon scan on this thing and discovered something a mile deep that was super massive. And then it was supposed to air on, uh, I think it was the Discovery Channel. And then the night that it was supposed to air, it got canceled. Yeah, and the guy, yeah, you know that guy's a familiar, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that, uh, the, the uh, Egyptian uh, guy. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, a wah, he's a wah, or whatever. Yeah, that guy is, uh, He's, a, he's definitely a puppet. Well, the Great Pyramids are located, well, the Great Pyramid itself is located directly at the center of the uh, land mass of planet Earth. So again, you have to have a very good uh, understanding of the, of the land mass and where to put the center of mass, not the center of the Earth, but the center of mass. And then the alignment with the Orion Star Cluster and the Sirius Star Cluster, Aldebaran as well. These shafts that open up on the sides of the pyramid, literally, in my personal opinion, send communications to those star systems. One of the things that the pyramid did was it used, um, obviously, water to create hydrostatic electricity and energy, which one of the um, side effects is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most widely used, or the, the most widely known compound in the universe, and we use hydrogen frequencies to communicate, and we theorize, we meaning science, scientific community, that hydrogen is the best Thing to utilize for communication. Inside the Earth, if you were to put a pyramid inside the Earth or the Great Pyramid inside the Earth and it was big enough to touch the corners, you know, everything would touch perfectly and fit in there, you'll find that those locations at the 19.5 degree on the planet, there's a lot of geological activity. So I researched it myself and you'll find like, wow, this is like really happening. In those regions around the around those around that planet in those rings. There's always something very, very interesting going on, very strange going on in, that, in those regions. Energy nodes, energy centers, they can't figure out where that energy is coming from yet. In some weird way, there's more energy getting generated from the planet than it's coming in. So usually we thought in planetary mechanics that the energy was being, you know, coming in, streaming into the cosmic energy from the sun and from the galactic equator was coming into the planet and creating this energy source and powering the planet. And given our weather patterns and everything else, it does have an appreciable effect on the planet. However, they're discovering now that Earth, even Saturn, they're saying that Saturn's core seems to be even melting from our probes, but detecting that. And they can't figure out what in the world's causes. I think there's two things that could be happening. One could be gravitational waves, which I talked about about eight now, ten years ago almost, that could be emanating from this second sun that I was talking about. Uh, this round dwarf is so massive. That it has it's so uh, gravitationally massive, it has the same mass as our sun, even though it's much smaller. But it's creating these ripples of, of gravitational waves. You want to call it gravity, whatever you want to call it, whatever it's propagating from this thing could be heating up planets. But also, in the correlation with that, something to do with the tetrahedron shape, which is basically what our Earth is, what the pyramid is kind of uh, mimicking, is generating this extraterrestrial energy field that's giving these energy centers. Yeah. So basically, there's something called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. I don't know why they gave it that name, but it was a totally separate galaxy from the, our center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And then they merged. And they merged, and they're still, it's still in the process of merging right now. It isn't even completed yet. It's going to take a couple billion years more for that to actually complete. 
the inner earth theory, to me, there's some truth to it. Um, I don't think that the earth is hollow in terms of like gigantic hole, like it's completely hollowed out. What I do believe, after looking at some uh, some places around the planet and going down into some very deep places, I went to Cacahua Milpa in Mexico. And I went about, wow, maybe uh, two kilometers underground. And the only thing that turned us back was the fact that oxygen was getting kind of thin. But this place is so massive, this underground tunneling system is so massive, you could probably, uh, I would say probably a half million people could have lived there if we were to develop and turn it into condos or something. Now, that's just one small place. Underneath the earth, there are these super massive openings that are more honeycomb style openings. And we are just like tiny ticks on top of a, you know, a dog. We're not even, you know, capitalizing on it. We're just nothing on top of the surface. The inside mass is where you can fit an enormous amount of stuff. So imagine caverns opening up for hundreds of miles, and even one, I think, in Asia that's so massive, it even has its own ecology and trees and lakes and even a beach underground. A lot of people call it a car, but yeah, but so I don't think that it's completely hollowed out with a giant sun in the center, but I do think that there could be civilizations living underneath there. In my opinion, it's very possible. We hope we don't even know what's underneath the ocean. Is this what Admiral Bird was talking about? Who? Admiral Bird. Admiral Bird, yes. Admiral Bird, yes. Admiral Bird talked about this, and uh, he actually uh, went to the region and went to an opening and everything else, and he just claimed that just keep it on. And he said he ran to just below Mount Shasta. I went there for seven days, and I literally stayed in this wooded area. It's something called a um, they call it a uh, it's a weird name. It's not a it's not a it's like a TV made of wood. So it's kind of a wood TV. Yeah, a yurt. Thank you. I went to a yurt. I stayed in a yurt. No electricity, no internet, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. <laughs> and uh, I went out there. One second, I went out there and I saw the UFOs, not only in the nighttime, but also in the daytime. Right out, and you can see Mount Shasta from that perspective. It's in the same area. I went to Mount Shasta and we got flora made and things like that. That's in uh, Washington State. But you can see it. It's, Mount Shasta is so big, you can see it from the city ranch. And here's the other thing. Every single day, you see a couple of Black Hawk helicopters flying over. Yeah. You see F-18s flying over. Why are they coming out here? Like, why would they be interested in coming over this this ranch? You know, uh, pretty interesting stuff. I believe there's people under there. I, I listen. That's one of my. A lot of these, to me, some of these UFOs, I think, could be coming in from from out of the earth. Yeah, that's what I think. They're coming from. I don't think. They're, I don't think all of them are coming from space. And even underwater bases too. Right. Yeah. Somebody said, "Where is it located?" What's E C E T I E C T. Oh. Yeah, E C T Ranch. You can you can go on the YouTube channel. James Gilliland owns that ranch, and uh, uh, he's got he's got a YouTube channel. You can see a lot of videos. It's gonna blow your mind. I mean, these UFOs, you, you can see them with the naked eye, and then they also have the infrared goggles that allow you to see even more. It's just amazing. That's why I was telling you guys yesterday, get a multi-spectrum camera right, great camera, and just point it up in the sky and then look at four hours of footage later and see if you can find out there. You there's no day that you can say I was disappointed traveling out there. You're gonna go out there and you're gonna see something. There's no way you're gonna I don't care what day it is, every day something's going on in that region. And I'm surprised it's not on like, you know, every channel. People come from all over the world to they come out there and these you know, they get tents and stuff, and they just camp out just to be able to witness this. And it's really amazing. And, you know, now that we got technology, we can document a lot of this. It's, it's so hard to even capture the moon on your cell phone. So when you capture a, a UFO on your cell phone, that's pretty amazing. And it's got to be a decent size, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff right here on this planet. You look down from Google skies back to Earth, you can see a lot of these underwater bases around the planet. A lot of underwater bases, a lot of these UFOs coming underneath the ground. <laughs>